let's give a big Kansas City welcome to Nancy Lublin. Thanks, Nancy. I don't have Oh, you don't need it? Oh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I, I haven't said anything yet, but it's so nice to have so many white people stand up and cheer for me. Thank you. I don't think I've ever seen this many white people in one place. Um, OK, that wasn't funny, so I'll say, go Royals. OK, great. So I am an entrepreneur. I was born this way, um, to quote Lady Gaga. Um, the story is true. When I was in preschool, um, uh, there was this boy named Seth, I'll never forget his name, who declared purple to be a boy color. And that included, I think, lavender, aubergine, eggplant, like all, all aubergine, eggplant are the same thing. But you get what I'm saying, like all of those Crayola purple colors. And purple was my favorite color. So I grabbed them all and ran around the classroom, apparently, with them in my fists over my head, screaming, I've got the purple. Uh, my parents needed to be called to school to sort of console me. And um, this should have tipped them off that I was a little weird. Uh, it didn't, and a few years later, I saw a globe and noticed that China was like the exact opposite from where I grew up, and so I went into the backyard and started digging to China. Now, your average kid would dig like a little hole and be like, that's cute, but I was born an entrepreneur. I dug a really big freaking hole. Um, my parents had to call in landscapers, actually, to like fill it and fix it. And then in high school, we had to write an essay on great world leader. And everybody wrote about Churchill, Kennedy, Thatcher, Reagan. I wrote about Attila the Hun. And again, you would have thought that somebody would have picked up on this. But back then, nobody could spell entrepreneur, let alone really know what one was. Instead, I was a girl with weird opinions and predilections, and so they were like, go to law school. Uh, law school is the place where ideas go to die. Okay? It's like a giant graveyard for ideals and idealism. It's an awful, awful place, and, uh, which I quickly realized. I thought I was going to be like Victor Cifuentes from LA Law and like use the law as a weapon for social change. And instead, I found myself reading like nine-point font textbooks and suffering through the Socratic method, and it sucked. And I came home one day. Actually, the weather was much like today, the rain coming down sideways. And in my mailbox was an envelope from a lawyer in Hollywood, Florida. And I was like, there's a Hollywood in Florida? And I opened it up, and inside was a check made out to me for $5,000 from the estate of my great-grandfather. And my great-grandfather came to America. He was the fifth male in Poland in a family of five males, um, Jewish. And at the time in Poland, Jewish males, when they hit 18, were conscripted into the army for 20 years. And his family knew what would happen to his four older brothers. So when he was born, they hid him. And they hid his birth. They never sent him to school. They didn't celebrate a birthday. And sort of when he got to the age of puberty, they stuck him on a boat for America. And he came to Ellis Island speaking no English. Actually, the funny thing is when he got to Ellis Island and they asked him in English what his birthday was, he didn't know, he didn't understand the question. So they assigned him December 25th, which is pretty funny for an Orthodox Jew from Poland. So we celebrated his birthday every year on Christmas. And he became a peddler. And my earliest memory of him was going to his car, and in the trunk of his car were those now beautiful overpriced jars you can get at Pottery Barn, but back then they were just practical, and he was selling pickles. Um, that's like what he was selling that week. He just, he just sold a little bit of everything. And it was really strange to get a windfall from his death. Like, I didn't earn this money. This was $5,000 that he probably worked really hard for. And so I thought, ooh, what do I do with this check? And I got into the elevator. And had you been in the elevator with me, I might have handed you the check. Like, you earned it as much as I had. And I had the idea for Dress for Success. I wanted to help women in this country get started and reclaim their destinies the way that this country let my great-grandfather start a whole new life. And so I thought, we'll give away suits to women um, who are going for job interviews coming out of shelters. And so I did what any Jewish kid from Hartford would do. I started it with three nuns from Spanish Harlem. 
which is a little strange. Um, it, they were wonderful. They each ran different social service organizations. The only thing was um, you probably shouldn't take financial advice from people who've taken an oath of poverty. So the nuns suggested that I take the $5,000 and put it into a six-month CD in the bank because um, it would earn interest, which was great, and I am forever grateful to American Express for only turning off my card twice in that first year. Um, there's a reason it's the card of entrepreneurs, because you only pay that $55 fee. Yes, I have a green card. Um, uh, that $55 fee, and there's no like other charges, they just shut you off, which is actually a gift to entrepreneurs, because you stop spending. Anyway, um, so Dress for Success. So I build Dress for Success from my apartment to uh, those 113 cities, and I'll tell you one fun story along the way that, that again shows that I'm a crazy entrepreneur. Everything was in my apartment. We didn't have space. It was the first dot-com boom, and everything was really expensive, so we couldn't find space for Dress for Success. So it was all in my tiny law student apartment, and I was so frustrated, and one night I said, I just, I'm going to go to the theater, and I got a friend to buy me a ticket, and I went to see Ibsen's A Doll's House. Like before it opened, has anybody, anybody in English major, anybody? There's like one dude nodding. I love that. If, thank you, in the back. All right, the original feminist play, and the big dude in the back knows it. I love that. I love that. Woo. So um, I went to see Ibsen's A Doll's House, and sitting next to me was Donald Trump. And he's shoving milk duds in his mouth. And I'm like, oh, do you have to own the company, or are those available in the lobby? And he's like, <laughs> uh, and, he, and I was, he says to me, um, I said to him, so, he says, so what do you do? And I don't tell him about law school. I tell him about Dress for Success. And he says, oh, do you like it? And I was like, yes, it's, it's great work. And he says, um, really? You don't find it boring? And I was like, no, giving suits to women who are going for job interviews that might change their lives. Like, this is not boring. This is really good stuff. I love what I do. And he goes, oh. And I was like, so what do you do? And he goes, no one's ever asked me that before. And I'm like, well, what do you do? And he says, oh, I guess I'm a builder. I build things. And I say, really? You don't find that boring? So we have a nice conversation. And um, uh, the, I go home, and I contact a friend. And I say, you've got to find me the name of his personal assistant. And my gift to you is it's Norma for Werderer. And I wrote it down in my file of facts, because this is a long time ago. And uh, I went to Blockbuster the next day, also proof that it was a long time ago. And I bought a giant box of Milk Duds. There's one guy who laughed at that. Thank you. I bought a giant box of Milk Duds and said to a cab, take me to Trump Tower. And I get to Trump Tower to security. And granted, this is pre-9-11. And I say, yeah, I'm here to see um, Norma for Werderer. And they say, sure, that's in Mr. Trump's suite. Go ahead up. So I get in the elevator. Have you been to Trump Tower? Or like you've seen The Apprentice? Right, it doesn't, it's not like The Apprentice. I go 26 floors up and the door's open and there's not like some beautiful woman sitting there. It's all gold and glass and mirrors. So basically he can see 26 images of himself at any given point in time. So through the gold and glass and mirrors, I see his date from the night before at the theater. I see like the woman who had been sitting next to him and I wave and she's like, the woman from the theater. And I say, yes. And she says, what are you doing here? And I say, I have brought Mr. Trump some milk duds. That was my best line. And she was like, yeah, he's, he's good. He's on a diet. And I was like, OK, look, here's the real deal. I need space. I'm running this not for profit. I need help. And she was like, you want to be in Trump Tower? And I said, no, but I hear he owns a little real estate in town. And she says, well, he's broke. And I'm like, yeah, it looks like times are rough. Could you help? She said, no. Um, I introduced myself. It turns out she was Norma Forwarderer. Um, and left. Now, a normal person would have stopped there and been like, that was pretty bold. But again, I told you I was born, I'm the Crayola warrior. I'm the girl who tried to dig to China. I'm not normal. I'm pretty weird. And so I got home and I write a letter, dear Mr. Trump, I swear I'm not some freak who's stalking you. I'm a law student. I'm starting this organization. Another box of milk duds, envelope. This time I get to Trump Tower and the bodyguards stop me and say, is this going to upset Mr. Mr. Trump? or Marla, who he was married to at the time. And I said, no, this will not upset them, but the fact that Mr. Trump brought his assistant to the theater instead of his wife might be upsetting to her. Um, again, and I got blocked and didn't, didn't get upstairs. Again, a normal person would stop there, but I'm not. So the next week, I was doing like breakfast TV, local breakfast TV, and I see in the chair sitting next to me is a woman who looks like Liz Smith, a famous gossip columnist. And I say, 
are you Liz Smith, the famous gossip columnist? And she says, yes. And I said, I have this story you might be interested in. And I tell her the story. And that Sunday, she runs it in her column in the New York Post, in her column across the country. And back then, talk soup used to be done by gossip columnists, and it ran everywhere. And the next morning, Monday morning, I take a copy of the New York Post. And I march myself to Trump Tower, and I say to the bodyguards downstairs, please tell Norma Forderer that Nancy Lublin is downstairs, and I'd love to talk to her. And he calls, he goes, yeah, she says, come on up. And I go up, and she says, we saw it. He thought it was really funny, but he just can't help you. Now, the ending to this story is I got the most beautiful rejection letter I've ever seen in my entire life. The Trump Tower logo on the letterhead is obviously made of gold. And if I scraped it off, I could probably make a beautiful filling for each and every one of you. <laughs> but I also got this great story that proves that I'm crazy and that proves I was born an entrepreneur. So the end of the Dress for Success story is it was successful. It expanded. By the time I left, it was in 76 cities in four countries. And so because I was born an entrepreneur, I was bored and it was time for me to move on because somebody else could run it. And so I spent some time sort of soul searching and writing and then got a phone call out of the blue from Andrew Hsu, who I just remember as the guy who'd made me a, a little hot and sweaty on Melrose Place. Um, but he called me and he had founded this organization, Do Something, and it had collapsed. Um, the idea was to start an organization for young people and social change that was as cool as sports. Um, and it was great, but in 2003, it had really collapsed with the economy, and they needed someone to come in and save it. And I thought, you know what? There is a need for a great organization for young people. It was the year after Friendster. It was the year before Facebook, and I said, I'll come in. Now, on day one, what I found out was that they had just laid off 21 out of 22 people. There was $75,000 in the bank, and they were 250 k in debt and they had lost their office space and everything was in boxes in storage in Queens and no one knew who had the key to the facility. Um, if you look up fucked company in the dictionary, our logo probably would have been there. It was pretty bad. Um, and so I took it on and I said, look, I'm gonna shut down your local remaining offices and I'm gonna put the whole thing online because this is the way to get to young people. And they almost fired me. It was my third week on the job and they thought, you're crazy. And I said, trust me, this internet thing is here to stay. It's not a passing fad. It's going to be a great way to reach young people. And P.S., sometime this weekend, it looks like we're going to hit 3 million members, which officially makes us the largest membership organization for young people and social change in the world. Yeah. So what we do at Do Something is we run campaigns. And there are over 200 campaigns live on the site right now. And a campaign is something that doesn't require money, an adult, or a car but that has an impact on an issue. All of our members are between the age of 13 and 25. On your 26th birthday, you're pretty much dead to us. You are officially old, sorry. And uh, a campaign is something like we do campaigns actually with Sprint here around texting and driving, where instead of being like, don't text and drive, it's bad for you, we make thumb socks. Socks for your thumbs, and we distribute them, and they sell out so quickly. They're free, but they go so quickly. And it's a great way you play Thumb Wars games with your friends. They're like little condoms for your thumbs to practice safe texting and safe driving. And it's a fantastic way to start a conversation with someone about texting and driving. So instead of being the friend that's like, hey, you really scare me when you drive, you can be like, ha ha, you really scare me when you drive. There's a much better way to start a conversation, an authentic way between your friends and we do a, a game um, around texting and driving also. We had 300,000 people participate in those campaigns this year. These are big scale campaigns. Or another campaign that we ran with H&M. In 2013, H&M uh, did upcycling of clothing in their stores. You could bring in your clothes of any brand and they would upcycle them and turn them into something else. And they collected about 100,000 pounds of clothes in 2013, which is pretty good. We worked with them this year and did a six-week campaign and really turned our sort of army of young people at this. And in that time, we collected 421,000 pounds of clothes. This is big scale social change work. So the secret to doing all of this work is what's in your pocket. It's your phone. That's the way that we communicate with young people. A third of my team writes code. 
I've got two full-time data scientists, and we're a tech company. We're just a not-for-profit tech company. Although, interesting, a not-for-profit tech company means I need to raise a round every year. And when I go raise a round, there's no hope of an exit from the people who fund us. So I'm still an entrepreneur. Because we do so much texting, it's led to my third startup. We'll text about 2 million people a week now. And we'll text them about that Thumb Wars campaign about texting and driving, or we'll text them about the Come Back Clothes campaign about recycling your clothes. And it has a 97% open rate. Texting is the best way to communicate with young people. It skews uh, Hispanic and urban, so it over-indexes. It's pretty fantastic. But there's one side effect that we didn't predict and that's been kind of a shocker. We'll text out about those campaigns, and we'll get a couple dozen text messages that are called out of flow. Things like, I'm being bullied, and I don't want to go to school tomorrow. Or, I'm cutting, and I can't stop. And the worst message we ever got was a little over three years ago. And it literally said this. It's a little heavy for this hour of the morning. But it literally, it said exactly this. He won't stop keeping me. It's my dad. He told me not to tell anyone. Are you there? And the employee brought that into my office, closed the door, and was like, I don't even know what to do with this. And uh, we were shocked and horrified that this could happen at all, let alone that this girl turned to us and trusted us with this secret and with this awful thing. And so I said, let's send her the hotline number. So we did. We sent her the hotline number for RAIN, which is a great organization about rape and incest. And we didn't hear back. And the next day, I said, let's send it to her again. And we sent it to her again. Never heard back from her. I actually don't know what happened to her. And it was at that point that I was like, this is no longer good enough. We can't just triage these text messages where they're contacting us for help with these personal things. Clearly, there needs to be a text hotline. There is no 911 by text. 13,000 people text it every quarter, and it just goes into the ether. So we built, basically, a 911 by text. It's called Crisis Text Line. It took me two years to raise the money, which I'm not proud of. It's really hard to raise money for not-for-profit startups. Um, but it launched a year ago in August, and we've already done three and a half million messages. Three and a half million messages. We're doing, we're doing over 12,000 messages a day. We launched it quietly in Chicago and El Paso, and it's now in every area code in the country. Um, we are intervening in one suicide a day. So it's over-indexing for suicide and depression. Um, there's no wait time. Sometimes when you call a hotline, the dirty secret about some of these suicide prevention hotlines is that there are wait times. So on the day that Robin Williams committed suicide, most of the hotlines had a two hour plus wait time. So you're suicidal and you call a hotline and you go on hold. We turn all of our text messages within five minutes. That's the key KPI that we organize for. You could be bullied in school, and you're sitting there at the lunch table feeling awful, and you could be texting us, and nobody hears you because you're not on a phone. And for spikes in volume text, the counselors can handle up to three kids at a time on the same screen because it's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So we don't need more and more counselors. We can handle those spikes. Text is a phenomenal way to intervene. It's also very factual. You tell us they spill their guts to us by the third message. There's no hemming and hawing, hyperventilating, crying, the word like, repetition. They just tell it all to us. It happens to be a phenomenal means for counseling. So I'm really proud of helping all of those victims and survivors, but the thing that is most exciting to me about Crisis Text Line is the data. So we're auto-tagging all of the keywords in real time, and we now have the largest map of crises in America. And we've put it under a Creative Commons license and opened it up for all of you. So if you go to crisistrends, T-R-E-N-D-S dot org, right now, you can see that the worst time of day for anxiety is noon. That the worst day of the week for eating disorders is Monday. That one of the worst states in the country for sexual abuse is Iowa. And think when we have a larger corpus of data that we'll be able to reduce this down to zip codes instead of states. And so a police department will be able to see when crystal meth hits the streets. 
A school board will know when they have a problem on a certain day of the week or when something spikes that they should be aware of. Um, money, resources, journalism, everything will be reallocated in different ways. You'll be able to see for the first time the relationship between bullying and eating disorders, because right now they're very separate organizations, but the data will bring them closer together. The most exciting thing to me about the data, the corpus is now large enough, we have the volume, velocity, and variety to get predictive. So stay with me on this. Um, with a New York audience, there's usually a greater likelihood that somebody in the crowd has seen like a shrink or a marriage counselor. So maybe some of you have too. It's usually a higher percentage in New York. But some of you have seen a shrink or a marriage counselor at some point in time in your life. I know that my marriage counselor is good when she says, Nancy, you're so brilliant and your husband's a jerk. I'm like, this is the greatest marriage counselor ever, right? Or you think that your shrink is good when she bills you on time or fairly and doesn't cancel on you. You don't know if these people are any good. There's no science behind any of this. Should your foot finish take five sessions to fix or like five years to fix? Who knows? We now know. So what's going to happen because of this corpus of data is in about six weeks from now, counselors will get a prompt and it's gonna say, this kid has used these six words in the last 10 minutes. There's a 90% likelihood that alcohol is involved. Ask this question. For the first time, we're going to be bringing science to counseling. Now think about what that means. Yeah, no, that's a really big deal. It means the quality of service gets better. It means the cost of service should go down because now we can use volunteers because we have these guardrails to catch things, right? It's like Uber for counseling. And then it also means the scale of this can get bigger. And that's just good math. So I want to open it up for Q&A by ending how I began, which is, I'm an entrepreneur. I was born this way. I'm not sure if it's a blessing or a curse. When things get good, I get bored, and I move on. I am not a poor manager. I'm not necessarily distracted or ADD. I'm an entrepreneur. I am not, by the way, a social change entrepreneur or a serial entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. That's what it means. Thanks. Thank you.